Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here, and many thanks for the kind invitation. Um, I, unfortunately, I have another commitment at 10.30, so uh, what I will do now is to shorten my lecture a little bit because I assume that uh, there might be one or the other question afterwards. So let me begin by shortly mentioning what my field of interest are. I'm not a legal practitioner. I'm not involved in criminal prosecutions, and I cannot tell you much about criminology, criminological facts about the realities of the Holocaust denial and uh, criminal proceedings in this matter in Germany. As a university scholar, my interest is criminal law and criminal law theory specifically, and also, of course, the interpretation of the criminal law as they are part of our criminal code. So my talk will be focused on the criminal law. I'm not a general media lawyer, so I don't know much I have to confess I don't know much about administrative law, civil law. I'm focusing on criminal law. What I want to do is to give you a brief overview of the situation concerning Holocaust denial, the legal situation in Germany. Let me begin with acts which are committed in Germany. I will split the uh, talk into parts. Um, acts of Holocaust denials which are committed in Germany and also acts which are committed abroad. The general offense description in our German criminal penal code, there is one relevant provision which is mostly applied in these cases. This is section 130 of the German penal code. And this has for many decades contained a general prohibition which is called incitement to hatred. That's the first section within this 130. Uh, criminal code. And this section will be applied to extremist right-wing propaganda if this includes also remarks against living persons, if denials are combined with vile accusation of living persons. So that's a typical neo-Nazi strategy to express statements about the past but connect them with uh, claims about present living people, for example, saying the witness statements about the Holocaust um, are invention and they are invented for financial purposes. This kind of attacks against living persons is be labeled as incitement to hatred. And um, if you read about the expression qualified Holocaust denial, that's what the German courts use a lot. A qualified Holocaust denial means exactly that. This is a incitement to hatred cases, which are combined expression of insults against living citizens and, in, and um, distortions of historic events. But the courts had, until uh, 15, a little bit more than 15 years ago, had some difficulties in cases when the, um, the uh, remarks or the, the, the statements were directed merely towards history. So if this person, the Holocaust denier, would not attack living persons, but would claim that he's merely talking about history. This was not covered under the incitement to hatred, if it, if, if it was not uh, combined with the statement against the livings. So there was a uh, gap in the criminal law, and in 1994 an additional provision was added, and I would call that a simple Holocaust denial to uh, differentiate it. The simple Holocaust denial is now section three in this paragraph 130, and this expresses explicit cases where I cite the offender approves, denies, or downplays an act of genocide committed under the um, rule of the National Socialist regime, either publicly or in a meeting, and if this is done in a manner capable to disturb the public peace. The punishment range starts with a fine and goes up to five years of imprisonment. The latest development was in the year 2005. Since then, in 2005, we have yet another section in the same par paragraph 130. This is now subsection number four. And subsection number four makes it a crime to approve, glorify, or justify the national socialist regime of violence and arbitrariness. Again, must be done publicly or in a meeting. The prison the maximum punishment now here is three years imprisonment. Now I suppose 
for if, if you heard that for the first time, it's actually hard to understand what's the difference between subsection three and subsection four. They sound very similar. Um, what, what's the difference? Subsection four um, is, has been introduced for a very specific purpose. There was a, con there was a specific background to that. Um, the notion in subsection four is that you don't have to explicitly talk about the genocide. You don't have to talk about the specific acts of violence. All you have to do is to glorify those persons who stand for the National Socialist regime. So it's actually, um, it's a much wider, anything positive you say about somebody from the National Socialist regime will fall under subsection four, while Holocaust denial must be talking about um, the Holocaust. Why did, why did the legislator introduce that section four, the newest one? Um, the specific uh, events I was referring to, they were marches, they were called mem memorial marches um, for uh, Rudolf Hess, who was Hitler's deputy. And Hess is uh, buried in a small town in Bavaria, in Wunsiedl. And uh, th this was, a, was becoming a spot for neo-Nazi uh, um, meetings who went there to ce celebrate Hess. And even the fact that they just went there, they didn't have to commit Holocaust denial, they didn't have to talk, just they were going there marching to this grave of Rudolf Hess. It attracted a lot of neo-Nazis, there were large groups going there, it also attracted counter demonstration, which then again l led to a lot of security problems. And the, the mayor of Wunsiedl was actually one of the most, um, uh, was one of the persons who was behind the new legislation because said, we want to, we want to stop that, we want to stop those kind of demonstrations, which is not that easy. Germany, because there's a uh, it's it's a constitutional provision which allows free demonstration, and if they if they were not talking, if they were not explicitly denying Holocaust, there wasn't much you could do about that. So there was this new inter norm introduced. Now it's a criminal offense if you just celebrate a person who is associated with or a, a leading figure of national socialism. And for this reason, now you can also prohibit the demonstrations. So it was the demonstration the, which were at the focus. Um, both offenses in section three and section four demand that this kind of conduct actually is capable of disturbing the public peace or actually disturbs the public peace. Um, there are some legal questions around that because this comes in addition to public, to public acts. This means that you have to act public and in addition you have to disturb the public peace. But in practice, this public peace element does not, for the courts, does not have a very pronounced meaning, actually. If you act publicly, if you act publicly, the general assumption is this is capable of disturbing published peace. Um, in framing the legal background, of course, one has also to mention another constitutional provision which is the right to free expression, which of course is also part of the German basic law. This is Article 5, every person shall have the right freely to express and disseminate his opinions in speech writing and pictures. Um, very few authors in the German criminal law literature um, have argued that free speech can actually justify Holocaust denial. Well, at least the simple cases. If you talk about incitement to hatred, things are a little bit more complicated. But what about the simple Holocaust denial, a mere reference to history, and um, is this protected by free speech? It's a minority who said it, it is. The majority opinion in the criminal law literature says it's not based on what our constitutional court says. For the constitutional court, there's an important distinction drawn between historical facts, facts on the one hand, and um, evaluation of facts, opinions about facts. The court, that's not specific for Holocaust denial, it's part of the general jurisprudence of our constitutional court concerning freedom of expression. If you talk about opinions, about assessment of facts, this is protected according to the constitutional court by Article 5. But if you talk about facts, and if these are evidently wrong facts, of course, this does not fall under freedom of expression. 
Now, if we would have a seminar here about freedom of expression, it's questionable. I mean, I, on a, I'm more critical about this view which the Constitutional Court takes in general. Again, this is not specific to Holocaust denial, but it's a general jurisdiction. Can we really distinguish facts from opinion about facts? And if you, t if you, if you take a view from epistemology, if, if you take a view from what do we know um, in terms of uh, the, the uh, uh, philosoph philosophy of epistemology, it's not that obvious that you that freedom of expression should not refer, uh, refer to facts which uh, a vast majority of people believe to be correct, so or to be or to be false in this case. But I leave that aside. Uh, I think for our purposes, it's enough to mention that Article Five is not really a barrier to um, a prosecution concerning Holocaust denial. There was one interesting recent case which has been decided by a higher regional court of Stuttgart which applied in one case a justification uh, and this was called a civil education defense. That was however an unusual case. case. What was the background? This was a young man who um, was not part of the right wing scene. He was not himself believing in the stupid uh, in the nonsense which Holocaust deniers are spreading. He belonged to a different kind of scene. He belonged to the internet scene which believed we should never censure the internet, we should never block internet um, pages. He was very active in this scene and for this reason, that was his motive, for this reason he had a, a couple of hundreds of um, uh, pages in the internet and he had uh, on his own page he had um, hyperlinks to these other pages and his purpose was not to spread um, the content, but to protest against any kind of censure in the internet. Now he was uh, he was um, prosecuted under German law because among these pages there were not all Holocaust denial denial pages, but some of them were, and he was uh, prosecuted. But then he was acquitted because there is this justification which is called civil education. Um, which the, the, the purpose is if um, uh, to allow some space for scholarly work, for journalists, and for other socially acceptable purposes, and this includes um, something which is called civil education. Obviously, this is not going to be applied to the standard Holocaust denial case. So much for Holocaust denial in general. Some um, remarks about Holocaust denial in the internet. Um, there are no really fundamental problems in terms of legal problems. I'm not talking about factual, but I'm talking about legal problems um, if, in, in, uh, if, you, if we turn to Holocaust denial via internet. If somebody puts a statement of that kind on a freely accessible internet page, that's a crime according to section 130. The same is the case if you send emails, if you send text messages, um, this is all dissemination of Holocaust denial facts. That's uh, there's no di dispute about. It. It's covered under the existing laws. This is also true if you do not identify with the content. There is a specific section. Again, this is subsection five, yet another part of our law, and um, this refers to people who disseminate these materials who have not made the statements themselves. So, if a journalist reports about um, Holocaust denial, he runs the danger to fall under this um, uh, prescription. Even, even he says, well, it's not what I'm saying, I'm just spreading the word, just spreading the word also is covered by this provision. Um, you mentioned the, the issue of host service provider. Um, there's a special law in Germany which is not restricted to the criminal law but also applies to the civil law. It's called the Telemediengesetz, a law about telecommunication. And this has some general provisions about um, those who provide services in the internet and it says host service host service providers will not be punished if they make prohibited content accessible if First, they did not know about it, and second, if they get knowledge about it, they remove it immediately. So, if they do it, remove it, uh, if they do remove it in a in a reasonable period of time, they will not be punished for having that information on their servers. Um, German law applies. Now, I come to the which will be one of the focuses here in, in my 
talk, um, German law applies when the offender acts in Germany. Um, this is the usual jurisdiction principle of territoriality. If the person acts on German territory, he will be punished according to German criminal law. What does that mean for the internet? For internet crimes, it means it's crucial where the computer is. If this person is working on a, on a uh, touch screen, if the person is working on a keyboard at a computer, and he's doing, he or she is doing this in Germany, it will be a crime committed in Germany. It does not matter where the server is. So if somebody works on a computer here and is uh, saving some material on a server wherever in the world, and as long as the person who is working on the computer is on German territory, we have no problem with jurisdiction. But the more interesting cases, and that's the famous case which some of you might have heard about, uh, I'm sure few of, uh, qu quite a few of you have heard about that case. The one famous German case concerning Holocaust denial in a more international context was a, an issue, was a case about jurisdiction. This is the Tobin case or Tobin case. Um, Many of you probably are familiar with the facts, but I will summarize them briefly. The defendant was an Australian citizen, Frederick, and Frederick Turbin, who had been active in the scene of international Holocaust deniers, and he had for this very specific purpose founded something called the Adelaide Institute. He was sitting in Adelaide, he was sitting in Australia, and um, he had posted material in the internet while he was in Australia. He made then the mistake to come to Germany and he was uh, arrested and prosecuted and also convicted for Holocaust denial finally in Germany. Um, from the point of substantive criminal law, this was an easy case. It was both, in, in the particular case, he had m made some statements which were qualified Holocaust denial, incitement to hatred. But there were also some cases which could only be classified as simple Holocaust denial, but they were not problems. It was clear that they would be applicable if the German courts had jurisdiction. That, that was the main problem in this case. Could we actually claim to have jurisdiction on this case? There's one norm in the, in, uh, the German penal code which applies to universal jurisdiction. This is section six in our, in our uh, criminal code. And you've already mentioned the typical cases for typical examples, which are also in the German criminal law, the examples for universal jurisdiction. Piracy is a prime example. Genocide is a prime example. Crimes against humanities, drug dealing, trafficking of human beings, counterfeiting of money is another example. But if you look at internet crimes, there's only one example there, and this is child pornography. Child pornography is covered by universal jurisdiction. So if child pornography, um, if somebody distributes child pornography somewhere in the world, there is German jurisdiction for that, but not for Holocaust denials. It, there's a, it's a list of offenses. They are listed up, and it's a not too long list, and Holocaust denial is not on the list for universal jurisdiction. There are other principles which extend jurisdiction beyond the usual territoriality principle. One of them is called the so-called active personality principle. With active personality principle, um, this, this uh, term refers to citizenship of the offender, um, which in the Tobin case did not help uh, anymore. Tobin had been German citizens once, but he was Australian citizens at the time of his offense. There's another principle which is called the passive personality principle, and this refers to the citizenship of victims. This has been applied by the German courts in, a re in another recent case, in the Demjanjuk case. Um, one of the reasons, I mean, it was not actually easy to, to explain why are German courts re responsible for Demjanjuk. Um, and one of the reasons, he was not a German citizen. They were not committed on German territory, his crimes. So. But one of the reasons the court cited was the victims, where at least some of them were German citizens, and this means that killing German citizens somewhere abroad would mean, in the Demianot case, the, the, uh, one of the ways to um, open up jurisdiction for that. But again, if you turn back to the Turban case, um, one could consider um, if the fact 
I mean, Tobin, I mean, on a, on a first read, there are similarities. Tobin did, um, did deny the fate of victims who died in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. So is it not similar like Demjanuk? Well, it was, um, it, the problem would have been um, that section 130 does not protect individual interest of victims. If you read in commentaries, why, why, do, why do we Germans have 130? It's not an, indiv it's not an offense uh, which is committed against individualized victim. The idea is it protects public peace. That's a general explanation. So with the passive personality principle, you can cover crimes against specific persons if they are have been German citizens, but not if it's a public peace offense. And another problem is, that would have been the second problem, um, the passive personality principle requires that the crime is punishable under the law where on which territory it had been committed. And that would not have, probably not have worked in Australia in the year 2000. So the passive personality principle wasn't an option, option either, and that might show you why it was actually quite difficult to come with an explanation for German jurisdiction. The, um, the regional court, the, the court of fact, had said we are not, there's no way, we, we, cannot, um, uh, we cannot sentence this, we cannot convict in this case, but our federal court of justice, the appellate court, did come up with a case for jurisdiction, and it says so, it applied the territoriality principle. Again, <coughs> went back to the old, good old territoriality principle. There is a norm in the German law which says, where is the crime committed? This is section nine. Where is the crime committed? It's committed where the offender acts. Well, that doesn't work because the keyboard he was working on was standing in Adelaide. But it also says, or where the result of the crime takes effect. The classical example which we always use is the bomb which somebody builds, constructs abroad, mails abroad, but it, it explodes in Germany. So although the building of the bomb was done abroad, the fact that it explodes in Germany would, su would be sufficient to say, well, this was committed on German territory. The problem was, can you apply that to internet crimes? And that's where the, the legal difficulties, the legal intricacies of the case begin. Can you apply that to internet cases. Well, the German Federal Constitution Court said you can um, in this case. But maybe it's, I start with the cases where you can't um, because the court made also clear that for some internet crimes of, of, other, of other types, it's not the idea that Germany is now responsible for every uh, content which is in the internet and which could be punished under German law. Um, just to mention one example, if you take simple pornography, by simple I mean no animals, no children, no violence. If you take simple pornography under German law, you can have access to that, provided you have an effective barrier for juveniles. It's a youth protection law. And um, this means that internet providers who do not have an effective barrier for juveniles could be prosecuted in Germany, um, w which is a source of complaint for German s for this kind of business because they say, well, we ca cannot do that in Germany, but obviously abroad there's a lot of these websites. So one of the concerns was if Germany now starts to control the internet, do we have to look for everything, including simple pornography? The answer is no, because the German federal court said, we are responsible for internet content only if there is a specific relationship with Germany. That was a key term in this ruling. Says, if there is internet content which can be seen in Germany, it's usually not our business unless there is some specific relationship to Germany. This opens up to a question which had already been mentioned today. What does that mean? Would German language as such already mean there's a specific relationship to Germany? The court did not go into details beyond the specific cases. This is not quite clear so far. But if you turn back to our issue, um, the Holocaust denial, the court said here we don't have a problem and I think he was right. If you follow that logic, is there a special relationship to Germany and somebody denies the Holocaust even if he does that in English and uh, even if he does, does do that in, in, uh, in Australia. But the fact that on German screens you can read these remarks because of German history, um, it, it creates a special responsibility, a special relationship to Germany. So this was the line of arguments to say, well, for Holocaust denial, there is jurisdiction, and so they sentenced Tobin in the end. 
Um, let me start, let me, uh, let me finish with uh, some more critical remarks, which the majority of German commentators on the Turban case were critical. If you count the numbers of people who have written about it, the majority is clearly critical, not because of Holocaust denial. The criticism does not relate to the specific cases and the, uh, the content, what he did, this was a clear case of Holocaust denial, so there was no discussion about that. But there, some, for example, one line of criticism was, if we extend universal jurisdiction, where the court did, in fact, this should be done by parliament, it should be done by the leg legislature, it's not up to the court to decide we're going to extend universal jurisdiction. Another, some of you might say this is a more formal argument, but the maybe more important argument is, what does this tell us about the role of German prosecutors, German police officers? Are we becoming the world police now, responsible to uh, comp the internet for, for any cases of Holocaust denial? It's not just an obvious practical problem, but it's also more of a question, what is what about state sovereignty? It's especially worrisome if you have to deal with states where the people there, where the legislator there, believes uh, that freedom of speech has a higher value than in most European countries. And even more worrisome, what does that mean if you think about internet content which we believe to be rather harmless? But there are countries which don't believe this to be harmless. Think about somebody who's producing, I don't know, underwear or bathing suits and has some ads in the, in the internet showing uh, women wearing a bathing suit, which can be seen in Saudi Arabia on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a screen. If you apply the same logic, and this person, the person who's putting this internet ads there, and he goes to Saudi Arabia on a vacation, he could be arrested there, because on the screen in Saudi Arabia, you could see this kind of obnoxious content for Saudi Arabian standards, and they could arrest this person here. So if you, um, if you allow countries to arrest and prosecute persons according to, to their own standards, which have acted to what their local uh, values would pursue is completely harmless. It has some implication beyond the very specific case. So in the end, I, I, I share this criticism, actually. I think there are good reasons to be more reluctant in this area of internet control, internet restriction. Um, so I'm personally not in favor of a wide um, version of the territoriality principle. But the German Constitutional Court um, uh, the, 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 um, had, had no objection to that, and the uh, Federal Court of Justice had ruled this way. So at the moment, it would not be recommendable for Holocaust deniers to make a vacation in Germany. Thank you. <laughs>